Okay, so we'll go to our next speaker, Justin Roberts. Justin Roberts is a cartographer, photographer, and drone pilot who loves to get outside and explore with his wife and kids whenever possible. Take it away. Hey, I just wanna say what an honor it is to be speaking to you all at NASIS 2020 today. So you want to collect aerial data using a drone. Here's how. I have a deep-seated personal fascination with getting up high in elevation or altitude to see things differently, much like the last two items in this XKCD comic on interesting timescales. I've loved climbing trees and mountains, but also getting up in an airplane or perusing Google Earth from any vantage point that I wish. In my years before becoming a certified drone pilot, and still to this day, there's something that holds true for me. Drones are pretty cool. And they can do so much more than capture simple photographs. Take this photo, for example. I stopped at this location along a road trip specifically because it was somewhat close to the downtown Sacramento area and in an area away from the airport where I could legally fly. When I got the drone up in the air, I thought, hey, this road that leads straight toward downtown looks pretty cool. Let's capture a vertical panorama and stitch it together. It wasn't until I was stitching the images back together at home that I realized that I had captured a face smiling right back at the camera. I didn't notice it from the satellite imagery when I was location scouting. It wasn't until I had my perspective changed that I saw the new picture. Seeing things from something other than where your eyes are normally located, about five foot six off the ground for me, can literally give you a new perspective. Sometimes all it takes is to change your viewing angle or altitude, even by just a few inches, to see things in a whole new light. As an exercise, I snapped a picture from my eye height of the play structure we have in our backyard, and then one closer to the ground, showing what my almost three-year-old sees. It's pretty clear that we see things quite differently. So to make things interesting, all that can be needed is a different viewing angle or altitude. Drones are perfect for this because they rarely capture anything from normal viewing angles. So where to start? The first thing to research is the make and model of the drone that you'd like to use to capture the data. So you'll need to acquire an aircraft. Most consumer drones are equipped with a camera that can capture both photos and videos, but a large portion of those drones are considered toys whose camera is not stabilized. I started out with a $30 toy whose 0 0.3 megapixel camera captured scenes like this one. I've loved photography for quite a while, so the whole point of this drone was to figure out if I liked getting my camera up in the air. After my first flight, I had that suspicion confirmed. From there, I purchased a DJI Phantom 3 standard that could capture 12 megapixel photos and 2.7K video. I became certified, and after flying commercially for a bit, that drone paid for itself twice over, so I upgraded to my current model, which is the Phantom 3 standard or the, the Phantom 4 Advanced, excuse me. It has one of the best cameras that you can get for this level of drone. It can shoot 20 megapixel photos and full 4K video. But with advances in camera sensors and drone technology, size doesn't always matter. This is my DJI Mavic Mini resting on one of the batteries of the Phantom 4 Advanced. To give you a better sense of size, I'll shrink it to approximately the actual size next to the larger drone. It's tiny, it's lightweight. It's so light that I've even taken it backpacking with me. But don't let its apparent toy size fool you. It too has an amazing camera with a gimbal that can take amazing photos like this one. When I'm able to capture photos like this, it just confirms something that I've heard in photography that resonates in many other industries. Your operating system, your software, your gear, it doesn't matter. If you know what you're doing and have a solid understanding of how it works, you can create something amazing with what you've got. So once you have an aircraft chosen, you'll likely need to gain additional knowledge, namely the regulations and laws and how to actually fly the aircraft and control the camera. We don't have time in this talk to go over all the regulations or the basics on how to fly a drone, but I will say the two most important regulations to look at, at least in the United States, are 14 CFR, the Code of Federal Regulations, Part 101 for hobbyist use, and Part 107 for commercial use. So what data can be collected? With most drones, you can collect both photos and videos, but LIDAR and thermal or infrared sensors are also common. 
the possibilities of sensors is much greater than these two popular options. I've seen a drone that can lift an adult human, so it really is up to your imagination and the payload capacity of the aircraft itself. As long as the sensor can run off battery power, it might work up in the sky as well. So how to conduct flights. Before you want to conduct a flight and gather data, you first need to put together a plan. Without a thought out plan, you could crash your drone. I may or may not be speaking from experience on this one. So when you're planning a flight, there are four basic questions that you need to answer regarding whether or not you can fly in a particular location. Can I complete this mission under FAA guidelines, namely part 101 or 107 in the United States? Am I allowed on this property or can I stand where I want to conduct that flight? One of the guidelines is the flights must be conducted within visual line of sight of the person at the controls, unless other conditions are met or a waiver is obtained. Am I authorized to fly in this airspace? Uh, is there controlled airspace nearby like an airport? Are there temporary flight restrictions in place? And is the flight, flight prohibited by local law? Essentially, can I take off and land on this property? Some other questions you may wanna answer during planning are, do I have the proper equipment to capture and create the product that I want? How many batteries will I need? Can this flight be automated to increase efficiency and make better use of that precious battery power? These last two questions will become easier to answer with aircraft familiarity. The last question, and probably the one that takes the most time to answer is, what locations, altitudes, and camera angles will I need? For this last question, I often turn to Google Earth to pretend that I am the aircraft and try to visualize exactly what I want to capture and where I need that flying camera to be in order to capture what is required. For flight automation, I use Litchi. Litchi is a platform where you can create your flight path, define altitudes for each point, and even control where the camera is pointing and tell the camera what to capture and when. If you've got a complicated project, this can be a lifesaver when trying to make the most out of every battery, although it's wise to have some juice left over in case something goes wrong. It's a good idea to learn all of the ins and outs of your aircraft and how to fly manually to capture what you need before using a platform like this. In case something goes wrong, you'll need to know what to do. So let's throw in through a quick example of how I conduct mission planning. I'd like to capture a picture of downtown St. Paul. So the first thing I do, especially for big city locations, is check the local airspace to see where I can fly and how high above the ground I can get the camera. My favorite tool for this is AirMap. If I zoom in a little, you can see the ceiling for each of the corresponding rectangles in this airspace. I'd like to check an area south of the river, so let's zoom into a spot where the ceiling is 400 feet. Once I've found my takeoff location in AirMap, I will take a look at that same spot in Google Earth. If we rotate and pan the camera a little, we can see the approximate view of something that we might see if we actually had a drone in the air at this location. This looks pretty good to me, so let's imagine a cloudy fall morning. Maybe it would look something like this. So how to process the data. So now you've captured some data and it's likely you're going to want to process that data. For a landscape photography example like this, if you get all of your camera settings as close to perfect to your liking as possible, you can get the best in-camera capture with minimal post-processing. For photos and videos, there are two dominant formats, unprocessed, which usually, usually looks flatter and with lower con contrast, and processed. Depending on your application, there are a wide variety of ways to process the data. For photos, most basic editing programs will work. You can even make the desired corrections on your phone while still out in the field. The same can be said for videos if you've got the right equipment with you. For the gear I have, I'm able to edit photos and videos right in the stock photos app on my iPhone, as you can see on the right. If I bring my laptop with me, I have even more capability in the field. The apps you have available to you are your best tools. However, some programs may be more powerful in terms of the edits possible. The stock photo, photos app on my iPhone can edit raw files, 
but it's not nearly as capable as Photoshop or Lightroom, for example. How to have fun through the whole process. If you haven't been able to tell by this point, let me be blunt. I like drones. I like photography. I like videography. But being able to combine these and my passion for mapping has been a dream. If I can combine multiple fascinations into a single task, it's always fun and much more enjoyable for me. I don't think I'm unique in this regard. And if you're like me, capturing your own data, processing it, and turning it into something beautiful and useful is not only fun, but also fulfilling. I do want to add that actually flying a drone at this location in the video is not only dangerous, but it's illegal. But that's where creativity, innovation, and MacGyvering comes in handy. The only way for me to get stabilized footage with the gear that I have is with a drone. So in true Minnesota State Fair fashion, I put a drone on a stick. In this configuration, it's incapable of flying, so it's no longer considered an aircraft by definition and therefore can be used on airport property. Bonus, what can you create with that collected data? The data captured from these flying cameras can be molded into a wide variety of products. You can use a series of photos to create highly precise ortho photos and 3D models. You can turn their aerial photos into works of art, and you can even live stream video from a drone while recording audio from your phone. You can create cinematic aerial videos from the stabilized footage. And as a bonus, you can also hold the drone in your hand on the ground or strap it to a pole to get stabilized non-aerial or pseudo-aerial shots. And of course, you can use drones to make maps. There are nearly endless uses for drones, but what you do with the data that you collect is completely up in the air. Thanks so much, Justin. That was a killer ending. Really loved that. Um, so one question that came up in the in the audience is um, any sources where there um, with a collection of drone imagery that's publicly available. Do you know of anything like that? Um, when I'm looking for ideas on something to capture, uh, I'll often turn to uh, a Google image search or uh, Instagram. There are lots of sources out there. Usually the first one I go to is Google images. Cool. Okay, that sounds good. Are there any other questions um, in the audience. Selfie stick for science. Yes. Um, great. Cool. Well, thanks so much, Justin. Thank you. Welcome.